So again, happy Resurrection Sunday. Yes. Now this is kind of unusual because normally I don't do Christmas and Resurrection Sunday. You say, why not? I usually have Nathan do that. Because I guess you can say I'm a little bit, uh, maybe sometimes have a little bit of a a bad taste in because I, I just feel like so much of Christmas, so much of Resurrection Sunday has to do with the traditions of man rather than what it's about. I mean, we have Easter egg hunts, we have chocolate bunnies. I like chocolate bunnies. I like anything chocolate, so that's all right. But there's so much that is really about the traditions of men rather than what the day is supposed to represent. Almost like Christmas, it becomes so commercialized. So much other things that distract from what the real purpose of it is. And I even saw this week that there's this one particular mega church uh, that was sending out their invites, and they said, don't use the words like the blood of Jesus, resurrection, or Calvary, because we don't want to offend anybody, right? So it's those type of things that a lot of times I will just kind of, yeah, Nathan, why don't you do that Sunday, you know? Uh, so, so I'm trying to repent and try to have an open mind. Also, a lot of times we have people who come on Christmas and Easter, and maybe that's the only two times they come, and some people say, well, that's good, but a little dab won't do you, you know? You, it, you need to be really involved in some church, some family, growing and being discipled in a church body. So what I'm going to do today, we're going to talk about the, uh, the resurrection, obviously, but I want to go back and start in chapter 27, which is the story of the crucifixion and the cross. We're not going to go through all that. We're just going to go through the, basically the last part so we can kind of set up for the, the resurrection. All right, so Matthew 27, and let's go ahead and pray again. Lord, we just thank you for this, Lord, this day that we celebrate the resurrection of our risen Lord. And Lord, we have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful, just to be in awe of you and what you have done for us. So, Lord, as we go through your word today, Lord, we ask that you would enlighten us, that you would touch us once again, even with things that we already know, maybe mentally, but it hasn't gone from our mental understanding down into our heart, Lord, that you would do that today, that you would touch hearts and minds today, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So again, we're starting with the crucifixion. We're going to start in verse 45. So Jesus has already been crucified. He's on the cross. A lot of things have already been fulfilled that were talked about in the Old Testament. And we're just going to go kind of verse by verse through this. And it says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. Now this was not a solar eclipse because... Uh, this was over Passover, and over Passover, you have a full moon. In order to have a eclipse, you have to have a new moon. So this was a total supernatural event that came, that happened for three hours from, from 12 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Verse 46, and about the ninth hour... Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elo, Elo, lama sabatini, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So again, a ninth hour would be three o'clock. And it's interesting that Josephus, who's the the great uh, Hebrew scholar, historian, he said that that third hour, that three o'clock in the afternoon, with the time of the evening sacrifice. So the lamb was sacrificed. And obviously, Jesus was our lamb that finished the sacrificial system 
that he was sacrificed once and for all on that third hour, or that three o'clock be the ninth hour. And what Jesus is quoting, he's quoting um, Psalms 21, or yeah, Psalms 22, verse 1. In fact, if you look, read through Psalms 22, you're going to see a whole lot of different things in there that was fulfilled by Christ on the cross. Okay, verse 47 through 49, we'll take a couple here. And when some of those that were standing there heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine and vinegar. He put it on a stick and it offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to him. So they were understanding. He was speaking that in Aramaic. Aramaic and Hebrew are sister languages, both Semitic languages, but they're different. So when he was going Elohim, or meaning God, he was picking up Elijah. So it wasn't, he wasn't calling out to Elijah. But they fulfilled the scripture where he put vinegar on it, offered him uh, to Jesus. So in verse 50, it says, When Jesus had cried out again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now it's interesting, it doesn't say this in Matthew, but in the Gospel of John, it, it, it says what he actually cried out, which is, it is finished. So that's his last word, it is finished finished. I've completed the task. Everything I was called to do to come has been accomplished. It is finished. And it says he gave up his spirit. No one took his life. He laid it down. Willingly laid it down for us. Willingly went through the cross, went through the suffering, took his, our shame, our sins upon himself and bore it for us. Okay, verse 51, it says, At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. So this curtain in the temple was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide, and it was rent from the top to the bottom. Now, the high priest would only go in once a year into the Holy of Holies, which is separated by this curtain, this veil, and only went in once a year, and then it was ripped and torn completely in two, symbolizing and showing us that we no longer need a priest to have access to the Lord that he has made a way where the path is now open that you and I can come before him and have that communion, have that relationship with him. So that was a huge uh, picture of the change that was happening by Jesus' death, that we have access now. We, don't, we no longer need a priest to go in once a year. We can stand before him ourselves. We can repent. We can confess our sins. We can, we can just have that relationship with him. We are no, no longer separated by that veil. Let's take 52 and 53. It says, The tombs broke open. And the bodies of many of the holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, this is only recorded in Matthew. But I want you to think about that. So many of the saints who have died, and by the way, Matthew... uh, 
he goes, he doesn't go chronological. He goes by topic. Like as you read through, you, he'll take a topic and not necessarily go chronological. So when it says they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. But if you read it in the order, you think, well, does that happen? That happened first? No, this actually happened later. But can you imagine people in Jerusalem who saw Aunt Mary? She died 15 years ago, you know. And what, what, what the scuttlebutt was in Jerusalem at that time, that here you had these saints that have died are showing up during this time. And we don't know, we don't have any other information about, well, how long did they hang around? Would, did they ascend with Jesus? Or, as in most cases where people had been resurrected, like Lazarus and different ones, they eventually died, right? So it's a very kind of unique, and this is the only gospel that has that in there. But how, how that had to be uh, stirred up a city when, you, when people are, are seen those saints who have gone and have been gone, you know, been dead for a while, and they're going to glory. All right, verse 54. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and explained, surely he was the Son of God. So this centurion and those who helped crucify the Roman soldiers, they saw all this stuff that was happening, and it's kind of like, this is not normal. We're having an earthquake. We're having darkness from, again, from 12 to 3 o'clock. Something's up. And they were, where it says they were terrified because they realized that. And so the centurion even says, He, he says, surely, or surely this was the Son of God. He should have really said, surely this, was, this is the Son of God. Because he is still the Son of God. He is still. But it was such an impact upon them, they realized, hey, this, this is not... We've seen many crucifixions. We've seen a lot of death. And this is not... Natural. This is truly a supernatural thing happening here. And then you always wondered, what were their lives like after that? How were they touched? Did their lives change? Did they end up becoming a Christian when they saw what had happened? So verse 55. Now many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So these women were there seeing where he was buried. You wonder where the disciples were at this time. It just doesn't mention them. It mentions the women. So they were faithful because they were coming and they were going to prepare the body for, you know, for the burial. But at the same time, they were not really thinking about and not really having the resurrection in their mind. They were just overwhelmed by what had happened. Even though Jesus, throughout the gospel, kept telling them, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, but I will rise again. It was like, over their heads. You know, they're, they're consumed at that moment by what they, they saw. He had died. All right, let's take 57 through 61, a little paragraph there. And it says, As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Now, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own tomb. And he had it cut out of the rock. 
he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance in the tomb and went away. Now Mary Magdalene and the other Mary was sitting there opposite the tomb. So they were watching where he was being placed. Now this Joseph uh, of Arimathea, he was actually a member of the Sanhedrin, but he didn't agree to what they pur purposed to do. And he was, a, he was actually a disciple of the Lord. Verse 62, the next day, one, one after the preparation day, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went out and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. To me, this is very interesting because Pharisees had more faith than the disciples did. You know, they had heard him say that. Hey, he said that he's going to raise up, you know, be risen after three days. So they took action. Disciples were hiding in a room, and and the, and the Pharisees remembered that, what he said, so they secured a guard. And these were uh, Roman guards uh, and sit, put a seal over it so they could prove that he didn't rise from the dead. They were afraid that disciples would steal his body. But I think it's, it's very interesting that here the, the Pharisees remembered that, understood that, and the disciples were like... You know, again, this is such shock, and that, that whole concept that he was going to rise in three days, they missed it. And even though Jesus had told them throughout the Gospels time and time again, this is going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And yet, even Peter saying, never happened to you, Lord. And then, you know, Jesus had to rebuke Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You set your mind on things of man rather than things of God. So... That was kind of the bad news, chapter 27. Jesus had been crucified. He died, put in a tomb. Looks like the enemy has won. Disciples are downcast. The women are downcast. They're being faithful because they're going to go prepare the body. But for them, it's, it's kind of all darkness. It's like, you know, what's going to happen now? What, where do we go from here? What's the next step? And so we get to go, thank goodness, to chapter 28 and the good news of the resurrection. So we'll start in verse 1. At dawn, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. All right, so this is at dawn on Sunday, and that is one reason why we, we worship on Sunday as opposed to the Sabbath, which is actually Saturday. So this began that change of worshiping on the day of his resurrection. So in one way, every day ought to be what we celebrate, the resurrection, because he is alive. In verse 2, it says there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. So, this angel comes down, he rolls back the stone, 
Now, he didn't roll the stone back so Jesus can get out, right? He rolled the stone back so others could come and look in. Jesus didn't need anybody to roll the stone back. He can walk through walls, doors, and he does that later in Jerusalem, right? He just appears. But the, the angel had such glory, and it says, uh, his appearance, the angel, his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So the Roman soldiers, hardened Roman soldiers, when they saw this angel, they saw the glory. It wasn't like the angel had a sword, but they were in such fear that they shook like dead men. They were completely overwhelmed by the power in seeing this this angel. Awesome angel. It's kind of like on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was, was transfigured before them on Mount Hermon. And the disciples are just kind of in awe because of the brightness of Jesus. All right, so let's go to verse 5 through 7. So the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. I would kind of add, just as we told you many times before, knucklehead, you know, <clears throat> come and see places where he, where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, and now I have told you. So when the first thing, again, the angel says, you know, do not be afraid because of the awesomeness of this angel. And I also wonder, okay, why didn't Jesus, why didn't Jesus tell the women to go do this? Why didn't Jesus just appear to the disciples? And I almost think it's because maybe to humble the disciples a little bit, the women brought the good news. The women were the first ones to see Jesus. And these other guys, in fact, of course, the disciples even, we find out a lot of them, what, no, they didn't even believe it. And I also want to think about you know, that, that Jesus was the first true resurrection. Because, yes, you had uh, Lazarus, you had uh, the young man who had died uh, being carried out, that Jesus raised from the dead, and you have a, Elijah uh, that was thrown into the tomb, or another man was thrown into Elijah's tomb, and the guy came alive. But all those people, they were resurrected, but they died. This was the first resurrection where someone is is. Raised from the dead, never to die again. And that's the same hope that we have now. It's just like Jesus said, and it said his spirit left him. When this body falls down, this earth suit, this jar of clay, your spirit man goes forever and will live forever. And we will receive a heavenly body and then a new body, both. All right, 11 through 15. What else? 8. 8 to 10, I guess. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go 
to Galilee, where they will see me. So again, just like the angel did, Jesus said, do not be afraid because the natural tendency, see something supernatural like that, is, is also fear. It says, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers. And to meet me in Galilee. And if you want to know about Galilee, you can see Rick Fox back there. He's got a whole, some information on that you might find very interesting. All right. So 11 through 15, another very interesting passage. It says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. Now, when the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So the soldiers come back and tell the high priest what had happened, this angel. Now, you have to remember that as Roman soldiers, if you fell asleep or you let a prisoner escape, you would pay for it with your life. So they had a double uh, motivation. One thing, they were paid a great sum of money, keep their mouths shut, and the promise from the Sanhedrin that if Pilate or anyone heard this, that they would keep them out of trouble and keep them from being executed. But I want you guys to think about what was that like for those guys the rest of their life? You know the truth. You know what actually happened. And yet you're telling this lie to protect yourself and because also you're you're getting a large sum of money. But it makes me wonder, did any of them ever become Christians? Because they actually knew the truth and what their life, and if they didn't, wouldn't that be burning a hole in you? Knowing what the truth is, and that you lied. So, I don't know, I, I just always go to those places wondering, okay, what was that like? If I place myself with them, how did that work out in their lives? What happened? And that we don't know. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us about... Uh, the actual appearances of Jesus to the disciples when they are in Jerusalem. He goes on the part about uh, going to Galilee where he's going to meet them. But we also know that 1 Corinthians uh, verse, or chapter 15, verse 6 says, over 500 people saw him alive at one time. So there was a gathering someplace a large gathering of over 500 that also saw him alive. It wasn't just the disciples, but it was a, a, a very large crowd. And as Paul was telling that story in 1 Corinthians, he said, and most of them are still alive today, the ones that saw him and can testify that, yes, we saw the risen Christ. So this next part is uh, what we call the Great Commission. So we'll just read through that. It says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Of course, we remember the story about doubting Thomas and how he wasn't there. And so, unless I see his scars and see the wound in his side, I won't believe. And Jesus. 
Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Not go make converts, but to go make disciples. There's a big difference. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. So as we look at that whole story, we see that the cross... The cross was the pavement. The resurrection was the receipt, proving that the pavement was fully accepted. So the cross was the pavement. Jesus paid his own life. He took your sins. He took my sins upon himself. He bore it on, a, on the, in our shame. Okay. He took it all upon himself that we might be free, that we might walk in freedom, that our sins would be forgiven, that we'd have access, just like the, the curtain was torn in two. And now we have access to the Father. We can come boldly before him, before his throne. And so that day, that day of resurrection... It's such a glorious, and I think all the songs that we, we sang earlier, you know, about the resurrection, about the stone being moved away, about what has been done for us. You can never overemphasize that, that you have the ability to come before the Lord yourself, that you have access, that you can pray that you don't need to go through a priest, that you can pray, you can confess your sins, that you have access because that, that curtain that has been completely rent in two and we have access in. And so again, the cross was a payment, the resurrection, the receipt, proving that it was paid in full. Because sometimes we think, that, well, yeah, but you don't know my sin. Like, I don't think God can even forgive my sin because you don't realize what I have done in the past. And so what you're telling me is that your sin is greater than the blood of Jesus. Oh, that's right. We're not supposed to talk about the blood today. I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And about Calvary and about coming resurrection. And, you know, one thing that Paul says in in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, too, he says, you know, if, if Christ is not, has not been resurrected, then you are dead in your sins. And if Christ is only a help in this life, then we're to be most pitied of all people. If this is all there is, sorry, guys, but there is more. We have eternal life. We have a future, and that's hope. That hope, hope is such an important thing that has to be in our life. But when we see that we have this hope of what eternity, no matter how bad things get here, no matter how bad things that are going on and maybe happen in your own life, the hope that we have eternal life and we will see him face to face because of what he has done for us. By the blood of Jesus, all the remission of our sins, all the things that we have done in our past and in the, in the future, because we're all going to be falling short, but we have that, that, that confidence that he hears us, he loves us, and he will never forsake us. And that resurrection, that resurrection Sunday... When he arose from the dead, he did away with all those things. He set us free. We have the ability to be free. It's also a choice. 
It's a choice each individual has to make. You choose whether you want the Lord to be your Lord and Savior or not. He doesn't make robots. Even the angels aren't robots because some of them chose to leave, to go with Satan, to be deceived. So we are free agents. But if you make that right decision, if you realize where, again, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, we are all guilty. We don't want what we deserve. We want mercy. And God has that mercy for each one of us today. So if you've never made that decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, Let it be today. Let it be the day that you come forward and and make that public declaration. Or maybe you've been away from the Lord. You know, you've kind of stepped back and things of time have just passed and you've kind of gotten away and you, you get really spiritually dull. And you need that rededication of your life to to set again and serve the Lord with all your mind, all your strength, and all your heart, to love the Lord with all that you are. Do that today. Also, if you need prayer for anything, whether it's prayer for healing, praying for a situation with relationships, whatever that need may be, feel free to come up. We'll have people up here to pray for you because we need one another. The body ministers to the body. We each need each other. And again, we are, as you know, Jesus gave the example of the human body and, and how we are all part. We all have different parts. Some of us are a hand, some of us are a foot, some of us are an arm. We all have different gifts, all callings, but we're all called to come together as one, ministering to each other, lifting each other, rejoicing those who rejoice, and weeping with those who weep. We are to be the body of Christ. But again, I want to just encourage you guys to have that boldness, to feel free to come up. We'll have a a song and a little worship, and you can stay for as long as you want. Those who need to leave, feel free to do that. But we'll soak up here in the front and be willing to pray for you guys. And just again, remember, today is the day of Resurrection Sunday, the day that we now have eternal life and that we have that future with him, that we will be resurrected, that we will get an upgraded, praise you, Lord, upgraded body. And as old as you get, you begin to see these things start not quite being like they were when they were 40 years ago or 50 years ago. But this new body is going to be much greater. No more sickness, no more tears, but only the love and the joy of the Lord will be our portion. So choose today who you will serve. So Lord, I just thank you for this truth of your resurrection. I thank you, Lord, that you paid the cost. You paid the price of taking our sins upon yourself to the point that the Lord Father had to look away from his son because he could not look at the sin that he was carrying on our behalf. And, And Lord, we thank you that he did not stay in the tomb, but he was raised from the dead to be alive forevermore. And we rejoice in that fact, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the price that was paid. Thank you, Lord, that we have eternal life with you. And, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.